These days, emulation is considered essential for the preservation of old games and bringing them to a new audience. But going back to the mid-90s, emulation was considered a dark art that was part of an underground scene with ties to illegal activities and questionable individuals, at least by reputation. The reality is, however, is that some very smart programmers paved the way for emulation as we know it today, painstakingly researching, documenting, and coding their findings. In 1996, if you had a fast 486 PC, emulation wasn't that desirable. They were slow and primitive, often riddled with bugs and crashing due to relying on guesswork because documentation was not available. The emulation of home computers like the Commodore 64, Apple II or ZX Spectrum to name a few was a challenge in itself, but these machines would have relatively good documentation. Emulating game consoles on the other hand, that were a much more closed environment, would be a step up. But the motivation to emulate would only grow. Getting a taste of an early NES emulator opened up a whole new world of possibilities. And by 1997, an emulator like Nesticle was running full speed NES games with sound on a fast 486 with good, but certainly not perfect levels of accuracy and compatibility. It would also streamline features that we use today, such as save states. Nesticle and iNES became so well known and mainstream that everyone was using it, trying to find ROM sites to download and try out for themselves, and it didn't disappoint. But emulating the NES was one thing. What about the Super NES? The rumors of the successor to Nesticle known as Snesticle would never eventuate, at least not until years later as an Easter egg found in the GameCube game Fight Night Round 3. By 1997, Nesticle author Isaratus had left the scene and was very clear that the Snesticle project had been discontinued. But this would not be for technical reasons, rather, it was due to the source code of Nesticle being stolen by a member of a group known as Damaged Cybernetics. Addis grew disillusioned with the emulation scene and left soon after. Now, Damaged Cybernetics was a grey hat hacking group and their main goal was the spread of free information to the public. They believed that all information should be free, whether that be intellectual property or otherwise. And while they were focused on some different areas such as audio CD ripping and MP3 audio, console copiers and whatnot, their biggest focus was on emulation. By this point, the race was on to emulate the Super NES, and surely it would be possible. After all, it ran a 16-bit CPU running at 3.5 MHz. A 486 DX66 or DX100 would have significantly more power, at least on paper. But the path to achieve a good level of Super NES emulation at good speeds would be long and arduous. The very first publicly released Super NES emulator was Virtual Super Magicom, or VSMC, which began its development in 1994 by Chris George, who went by the handle The Brain. The emulator was primitive but showed promise. It could run simple homebrew demos at the time, and later on commercial games like Super Mario World and Final Fantasy II. Although, in my personal experience, I've never been able to run anything outside some simple homebrew. VSMC received much popularity, but it also received much criticism, as it was offered as shareware which crippled the emulation experience to only allow a yellow color palette to be displayed. This would in turn lead to much outcry and protesting from the emulation community because they believed that emulation should be free. VSMC received updates all the way until 1997, but when cracked versions of the emulator appeared allowing access to all the features, the brain left the scene soon after in frustration. VSMC was popular mainly due to these reasons. People had heard about it, but when running it would offer a poor experience overall with very slow frame rates. In 1996, another Super NES emulator would appear, Super Paso Fami. This was developed by Nobiaku Andu, and he also had built the Paso Fami emulator for the NES previously. SPW was a very impressive early emulator, but it was a shareware-based product that was time-crippled. 
But things would really start to ramp up in 1997, when developers Lord Eastness and Ishmael released the first ever freeware Super NES emulator with sound known as Eastness. It was written mostly in C, but the complex tile drawing of the Super NES was written in assembly language. It would also emulate the SPC700 audio hardware and sound was a reality if you had a sound blaster or better card in your system. Performance was decent, certainly better than VSMC, but not optimal. At this point, more people were understanding the complexity of emulating the original hardware on a 486 PC would be quite challenging. According to Lord Eastness's webpage, a 100 MHz 486 class processor could run at about 50% speed with sound disabled and a frame skip of 4. Eastness was a quite feature complete emulator that handled all screen modes, tile scrolling, priorities, mode 7, most ROM formats, all screen map modes, sprite and background priorities, save states and more. This would mean a good level of compatibility. But full speed emulation would only be possible if you owned a Pentium machine at 166MHz or more. Another early challenge for Super NES emulation was transparency effects. This was difficult to emulate simply due to poor documentation. The hardware can handle color addition, color averaging, color subtraction, and color subtraction then halving. But with the added complexity on how to apply these operations to the SNES's background layers, meant that this functionality was left out of early emulators. It was at this point where many emulators would start favoring running under Windows instead of DOS. ESNES itself was discontinued and joined forces with another emulator, NLK SNES. NLK SNES initially ran under DOS and it was fast, very fast, with assembly language handling the CPU and tile drawing. But unfortunately, it had no sound. And while many users were enjoying NLK SNES because it ran pretty well on a 486 class processor, it did have its limitations, notably compatibility with ROM support not being great. At the same time, another emulator had started rising in popularity, SNES 96. Originally developed for Linux by Jeremy Coote, who also had the online alias The Teacher, was in the same damaged cybernetics group as The Brain, the author of VSMC. SNES 96 was an impressive achievement and featured sound and good compatibility. It was, however, initially quite slow. Jeremy discontinued SNES 96 and started over with SNES 97, a much more focused effort that ran under Windows and used DirectX for its graphics API. It could achieve mostly full speed performance with a 133 MHz class Pentium machine, but it did not include any sound. By 1997, there was no less than six Super NES emulators that were being developed at the same time. And this led to an all out war between the different authors taking shots at each other. The ultimate goal here was to see who had the best, the fastest, the most accurate with sound Super NES emulator. While Jeremy had moved on to SNES 97, Gary Henderson, another emulation developer took over SNES 96 and did considerable work to add features, fix bugs, and generally speed things up, with the CPU core being rewritten in 100% assembly language. While SNES 96 was fast, that accolade belonged to NLK SNES. It was the fastest around. And this is where the war of who had the best Super NES emulator began. SNES 96 author Gary Henderson would take shots at NLK SNES, calling out its low compatibility often mentioning them in the SNES README documentation. But the author of NLK SNES, Nerlaska, responded with, We are not like Gary Henderson, who can't take an ounce of competition. The war between NLK SNES and SNES 96 raged on for months. That is, until Nerlaska apologized to Gary Henderson in one of the versions of NLK SNES, by simply stating, Stop the war. In 1997, SNES 96 version 0.73 was released, but it was quickly renamed to SNES 9X. It turns out that Jeremy Coote and Gary Henderson had the idea to merge both SNES 96 and SNES 97. SNES 9X was a combination of excellent ROM compatibility, great speed, and of course, sound. 
and it's been one of the most popular emulators ever since. It's still very much active in the community all these years later in 2021. Although NLK SNES was discontinued, it did merge with eSNES to become NLKE. This emulator would combine the compatibility, the transparencies, and the sound for the first time in Super NES emulation, and it was a highly regarded emulator at the time. With each update, SNES 9X quickly pulled away from the competition and became the best outright emulator. But on October the 17th, 1997, a new emulator would appear that changed everything. The emulator was called ZSNES. Developed by Demo and ZS Knight, it was written in 100% assembly language and claimed the top spot for the best and fastest SNES emulator around. A 486DX100 could run most games at full speed. Initial versions of ZSNES were exclusively running on DOS via command line, but quickly would incorporate the famous GUI that became so popular. ZSNES had a very active community with constant updates. This meant improvements to compatibility and the inclusion of custom chips such as the DSP-1, SuperFX, SA-1 and others. ZSNES also would have a very good netplay implementation that was simple and easy to use. But overall, the emulator had its issues. Sacrificing outright speed meant hacks needed to be introduced. Some games simply didn't work such as Super Mario RPG and overall the sound emulation is quite poor thanks to the integer-based audio timers. And most of the custom chip implementations have their own issues. This means that compatibility, while still quite high, meant that it would be only a matter of time before you ran into an emulation-specific issue. But even still, ZSNES was the most popular Super NES emulator for years, and the team released the source code under the GPL license. The problem, however, with ZSNES was that it was so tightly coupled with x86 that it was impossible to port and run elsewhere. Over the years, ZSNES continued to receive updates, but ultimately was discontinued in 2007 and now is considered obsolete. But its legacy and impact on the emulation community in 1997 cannot be understated. It showed what was possible on 486 hardware. But the only emulator that would emerge out of the war of 1997 would be SNES 9X. It remains as the emulator that's still being used today. It runs on many different platforms and architectures thanks to its portability and open source nature. And this is a credit to the original work done by Gary Henderson and Jeremy Coote. In 2021, there is far more accurate SNES emulators that you can download and use, but these come at the cost of requiring powerful hardware. It's amazing to imagine how SNES emulation was even possible on a single threaded 100 MHz PC back in 1997. It does make me wonder about the early developments of Super Nintendo emulation back in 97. If that didn't happen, whether the landscape of SNES emulation would have changed. But let me know what you thought about this episode in the comments below. I definitely had a lot of fun putting this one together for you guys. And as always, we are going to leave it here. If you liked it, don't forget to leave me a thumbs up and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye for now.